everyone. My name is Rebecca Parsons. I am one of your co-hosts for the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast. And I would like to welcome today first, uh, Tim, who's a ThoughtWorks colleague. Hi, um, yeah, my name is Tim. I'm a technical director and I'm, I'm also working as, as the head of the Scale-Up Initiative in, in North America as, as well. And we are joined by a former ThoughtWorks colleague, um, Ajay and I work, work to, to, together quite a bit uh, in the UK. Um, Ajay Gori, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, uh, thanks for hosting me. It's amazing um, in terms of coming back to kind of a, uh, our own company, which I joined like in 2001. Uh, and I worked with, with ThoughtWorks for almost 10 years and then went on a different journey. Currently, I work as operating partner for technology at uh, Sequoia India in Southeast Asia. And before that, I was group CTO for Gojek, um, running Gojek out of uh, Indonesia and four more countries for 16 products. And we had amazing journey over there. And at that point of time, also, I ended up working with ThoughtWorks because one of the, the projects needed really help. Um, so yeah, been, been in this industry for 25, 25, 24, 25 years, have been working uh, closely with the startups now. And right now, my passion is mostly helping and building uh, help build startups with our portfolio companies. Excellent. So our topic today is technical debt, and we want to focus on technical debt in, in the context of startups and scale-ups, because obviously technical debt uh, arises in different ways, um, and there are some kinds of technical debt that are much more relevant, say, in, in, in an enterprise context. But I think we're all familiar with the concept of, of technical debt, but Ajay, how do you think about what technical debt is, where it comes from, and when it becomes a problem? So if you look at, uh, in terms of, uh, like in terms of technical debt, it's, it's mostly comes from two kinds of things in early stages of a startup, right? Uh, one is the time pressure. Especially in time, like we have ship on time, we have taken shortcuts, we know it's problematic and let's do it. Second, in early days of a startup, the technical debt comes from um, what you say, innocence. I call it innocence. The reason I call it innocence is because you don't know what you're doing. You're trying to go through things. Um, I'll give you a simple example in early days of project. Um, what we are doing is we are trying to find the nearest driver uh, to the customer. Uh, it was first time uh, for me also doing it and there were people who were trying to do it over a period of time. And one of the things which happened uh, was easiest one is to put a customer in the center and go around circle and see what is the radius and find drivers over there. But you can find a driver who is near 10 meters away from you, but saw other side of a road. And he's like on one way and he's like five kilometers away from you on the routing side. But other, other side, other there is one more driver who's like 100 meters away from you, but he's coming towards you will reach you within like one minute, but we did not know. So technical debt, the way, the way we started, we put a simple geometry over there and started finding drivers. But that was technical debt. We had to retype the whole thing again to do a proper routing stuff, right? The second iteration where we did not know was to actually get a bunch of uh, big database servers, store the lat longs, store the routes, all the stuff. And eventually we went to Google's S2 library and started working on that. In these three stages, we actually kept repaying our technical debt every three months as we are iterating over the problem. So this was a problem of innocence. It was not problem of recklessness. It was not problem of like not knowing. Then there is something called like actually Martin talks about this in his one of his posts long back. Um, he wrote it, uh, which is he's called like software builds a cruft, right? And cruft causes changes to take more effect. And uh, and the technical debt metaphor treats the craft as, as a debt. So that is a second way of looking at it, right? Um, and one of the things which, which happens is most of the time in the startups, the innocence technical debt is, is rarely happens because a lot of people who are building is kind of experience, but time pressure, recklessness, or uh, how you call it, um, uh, going like going into this self-inflicted pain kind of thing. Like I know it's going to cause a problem, and I am going to go do it. So that is the technical debt, which is more more what you say occurrence. We will see that occurrence way more than anything else. 
So that's how I see technical debt builds up and it builds up very fast in early stages. Well, and I guess one question I, I, I would have, and uh, if, if you really don't know your product fit, product market fit, is it reckless to just see what you can get out? You know, but you, you use that, that, that term reckless a, a, a couple of times. And um, I, I remember working with, with, with a client and he was very much in a, in a research experimentation phase. And he completely rejected all of our, you know, unit testing and, and all of that. And he said, I know I'm at least two instances away from something that I think is really going to work for the long term. And so to him, because he was willing to throw it away, and I'd, I'd already seen him throw it away twice. So I knew he was actually capable of saying, okay, I'm going to start over from scratch. So is it really reckless if you don't know yet what you're really trying to build? If you don't know what you're trying to build, then it's innocence. Um, so I ah. use the word innocence as well. Okay. Uh, so if you don't know what you're bring, it's in, in a sense, and then that's perfectly fine. And that happens a lot in early days as well. As long as you are okay uh, with not falling into the trap of sunk cost fallacy. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest mm -hmm. problems that happens with innocence is that uh, we developers, I have been guilty of that. We write our code and we kind of treat it as like our baby and we do my, my precious kind of thing, like very negative mm -hmm. conversation over here. But the sunk cost fallacy is so prudent, so apparent in 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 um, our world that we should be able to re redo it, redo it again and again. Uh, and as long as you are okay with that, then it's more of innocence, and you're trying to yeah. iterate, ideate, and implement, which is perfectly fine. I always say, uh, I actually I, I always tell people that the only way um, you can go faster in a startup is ideate, implement, iterate, and then code deploy automate. That's how you should do it all the time. And if you do that, then it's an innocence which plays a bigger part as long as people understand. People should know. I always say oh, one more thing saying, every decision, whenever you make the decision is the right decision. Only time tells you that it's right or wrong because time gives you more exposure. Time tells you more knowledge. Time tells you more domain expertise. So time will tell you is it right or wrong, but at the point of time, it's the right decision and let's move on with that. Because a lot of time, people actually end up blaming each other on this in, in the ecosystem saying, you did that wrong, you did that yeah. wrong. But it's not it's not somebody's fault. It's just how much ever they knew. So innocence, I will say, plays a lot bigger role and people should realize that, that it was our mm -hmm. innocence. That's all. And I, I, I expect him as startups transition into that scale-up phase, they're probably going to have a very different perspective on, on technical debt. How, how, how does that fit into what Ajay was talking about from your perspective? Yeah, yeah I mean, I agree um, with what AJ is saying. Um, you know, I, I, the way I think about it is, is the startup is leveraging, is leveraging that debt, right? Um, but it's, I think it's, I think the problem, I think probably we were saying that the problem is if you don't know that you've actually, if you've, had, if you've actually generated that debt or not, right? I think that's that's the problem sometimes that, that the company doesn't doesn't know. So, um, I mean, we're, so we, you know, in North America, we have a portfolio of about twenty different companies, and you know, number one, the reason why they, uh, you know, when we ask what's their problem, why is their, why do they think their their growth is going to be bottlenecked, it, it's it's around. You know, technical investment and, and technical um, technical debt, um, and often at that point, it's kind of like a bit too late um, because because at that point the, the technical debt has grown so much that they they're feeling it right. They they're like they they can feel the effects of delivery slowing down, of you know resilience dropping, customer experience dropping, and 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 that kind of thing, right? The smarter, and this is probably what AJ is alluding to, is, is like is the ones that kind of like are able to spot it a bit earlier um, and know that it's there and deal with it with sort of like um, you know rewrites and rebuilds, but not of the whole system of, of of pieces, and it and and so you catch it before it affects 
you know, affects the the, pro, the business growth. Um, and that's uh, that. <laughs> that's the idle situation. Most situations, the, the I mean, obviously, the, the the nature of people working with works is that they have a problem. So, so often, often it, it is that sort of um, technical debt problem. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I will yeah. say one. Uh, can I add one more thing on this? Yeah, one thing yeah. which I realize a lot of time people actually do not um, seek help. So I'll tell you this: um, uh, how do you how do you define define this behavior? Where I think I know everything. I say I think we, there is one more thing which is called overconfident technical debt. That's what it is. Um, so a uh, lot of time people don't seek help, and I always encourage people to go ask people, tweet about it put a post, put a blog, reach out to your friends, colleagues, or, or many people, like I, when I'll, I'll tell you when, because that will help you not to make many mistakes. When I talk to many, many companies, I tell them, look, I might be a very small packet of success, but I'm cargo full of failure. I can tell you hundred ways that things won't work. At least removing those options, which won't work, will allow you to actually go on to the options, which may work, and so thus reducing technical debt to a great extent as well. So one of the things which people don't do is so there may be three, con three types of technical debt. One is like reckless, um, second is innocent, and third is overconfident. And that's how the technical debt, debt comes in. As long as it is innocent technical debt, it will get paid much, much better way. But if it is reckless or if it's overconfident technical debt, that means you're kind of making some one-way decisions which will lead you to... Um, pay it heavily, like you can't pay it, like it, it, it will ask you, it still ask you ransom at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, like, you know, sometimes we come to these companies and, you know, they've reached series C or, or D or something and we come in and look at the, look at the tech and it's, you know, 10,000s of pearl code, <laughs> lines of pearl and you're like, how did you survive this long? But then you're kind of like, you know what, maybe this company is really smart. Like they, they got to the they got to the point that they you know they got to the hyper growth stage and got enough funding and and, and brought brought some outside help to, to solve it but um but they they definitely were suffering with low morale of, of developers and you know and, and and then obviously the product and, and those kind of folks being very frustrated about it but but it, it's it's an interesting question <laughs> but yeah well when when I think about it too from the perspective of um how how do you convince people to let you pay down the debt it's it that that that's often when i'm brought in to you know explain to the engineering manager or the vp of en engineering this is why we we have to do this the advantage if you let it get to the point where your systems are crashing and your customers are unhappy you've got all kinds of evidence <laughs> to say this is this is the problem you know this is a you know the building is burning down so we, we have to do something about this. If you are trying to stop it before that happens, how, how, how do you find that point? I mean, it, it doesn't seem to me that it would be easy to figure out when, okay, now I need to, you know, not, now I need to start addressing this. I'm curious how you spot that, that point in time. This is the one, one, of, the, this is the one of the most, most frequent questions I get asked by a lot of people. Uh, who we partner with. Uh, the CTO has asked me, like, how do I convince my CEO or business person to um, get me this break? Uh, and I tell them two things. One, look, at the end of the day, uh, what, what is your true North Star metrics? Get more orders, go faster, do this, do that, whatever it is. What is you are trying to do, if you can align that um, with Making so there was a long back, I think back 10, 15 years back. One of the one of the one of the stories I heard is that like, does this make car go faster? Um, and there was one accountant who was trying to do something, uh, and then somebody said, How would make how would this make the car go faster? And accountant said, like, No, I'm putting a better expense management system, so drivers spend more less time on filing expenses, so they get more time to practice. If they get more time to practice, then eventually they will be able to get more practice and car may go faster. And that's a very indirect way of aligning technical debt or something like that to a success to a thing. And that's exactly what we did at Gojek multiple times is like, look, we need to improve our developer experience. 
which is like totally non-functional requirement. It's like, there's no way we can align that. If we can go and talk about saying, this is what it will end up. So a lot of time I always tied up our technical debt as a, in money uh, to the business people. And this is what is a, it's a, it's a monetary, this is what is the product or this is what is a growth impact eventually. And also whenever you're paying the technical debt, the result or the gratification is there is no instant gratification. Technical debt, if technical, technical debt accumulates over a period of time, it also paying off technical debt also rewards you over time. So there is no instant debt. So people need to understand this, that if you go and solve technical debt, you pay it as a AMI, you pay it in the installments, and also the gratification is long-term, it's not instant. So as long as you have these two things, saying align every effort to the money at the end of the day, and align every gratification to a power of compounding over a period of time, then only you can measure it over the period of time, and then only you'll see the value of it. Uh, we did take fire break in Gojek once. So I'll tell you a little bit of Gojek story. So we launched around nine products in six, uh, 16 products in nine months in 2016. That means you're launching around one and a half products every month or two products every month almost. And we are accumulating a lot of technical debt all over the place. A few of, few of it was deliberate or, um, uh, and so some of it was like innocent technical debt. Uh, we also had overconfident technical debt some places. <laughs> but but all of your time, once you have this 6,000x growth, and, and to put a perspective, we are doing around 5,000 orders per day in 2015. By end of 2016, uh, we were doing around a mil- to one, one and a half million orders per day. So that that scale was crazy, right? Uh, given that scale and, and everything, whatever goes, whatever makes more orders is the right thing to do. But we accumulated a lot of technical debt, and we just said uh, around December 2016, let's take a fire break, let's just stop everything and repay this. That is that is one of the things which never works. But you can only achieve like 50% of it because you cannot stop a running engine. There is no way you can stop a running engine. Like it's, it's like running car, you are always on track. You're refueling on the on the on the track. You are putting the tires on the track. You are somehow you are doing everything on the track. Um, that's how startups are, but taking a pit stops are better. So we, we started learning multiple pit stops on the way and stop for a small time and do one small things and then again, gain the speed. Uh, and so fire breaks don't work, but taking pit stops works a lot, but you need to have multiple pit stops, not every lap pit stop, but like 10 pit stops in the, in, in one lap where you're constantly still have sense of moving and not stopping, but also you are getting over the period of time, you can remove the split stop and get better this stuff. So, so basically, at the end of day, what we realized is that aligning to business objectives and waiting for the gratification over the period of time makes a lot of sense. So I'm I'm drawing uh, inferences here that, that, that I want to, to, to make explicit. A pit stop is just a very short maintenance break where you go in, you you solve you you solve an isolated problem and then then go on, um, but what what is the scale of a fire break? I mean, I, I I'm assuming this is we're going to pause, we're we're going to isolate, and then we're going to do a lot of work. You know, is this an iteration? Is this a quarter? You know, yeah, fire break is like more than iteration. Like they're like, uh, so 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 fire break is like think about this. Um, you have fire in the jungle and as fire is reaching to you, right? Uh, so what you do, the best lot of strategies are in place, but what are the other strategies? You put a fire at other end and that fire actually goes towards that fire and stops the rest of the jungle. Burn. That means uh, a fire break is literally, you're trying to not douse the fire, you ignite more. So you're creating more chaos, but on the other hand, to bring stability. So it cannot be one iteration. It is goes to like four, five, six iterations. So our fire breaks, First fire break was like two months long and second fire break was like one month long. But the second fire break worked very well. The reason was that we took it during Christmas, uh, 2017 Christmas. And also we counted it as part of attrition and not as a, as a fire break. So earlier we counted attrition as part of fire breaks, but this time we counted fire break, fire break as part of attrition. And that is much more understanding and rest of the organization was going on. We only fixing one part. So stopping and fixing everything in fire break 
rarely works if you have a engine humming all the time. But making firebreak part of your iteration, that means you are only replacing a tire or only replacing a chassis, uh, not chassis, a piston or something like that, then it makes much more sense, right? So one of the things we learned is make firebreak part of iterations so and not iterations part of firebreak. Okay, thank you. So, so Tim, do you think the um, the the justifications for when to start paying off technical debt d- does that vary between being a startup and being a scale up from from what from what you've seen? That is that's kind of a a, a scale, right? So, if we talk about um... I, I think it. I think that there are there are sort of inflection points that, you know, what might happen is, like a team might know how to kind of work around the sharp edges. You know what I mean? Because they 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 kind of built, they kind of created all the technical debt, right? So they know how to avoid it. So one sort of like inflection point is when a team is about to expand rapidly, because um, at that point, because you have to think about. Because often technical debt is felt in onboarding, right? Because you you have to learn um, all the weirdness and complexities in in the code. So if by you know scaling or becoming um, growing, I, I think I think that's one point. And it could be scaling by um, headcount, um, and the same could be true about when you're adding more customers and things like that, right? Because you know perhaps the there might be um, places which you haven't automated, which are okay, right? Because, you know, you are only adding a customer every so often. There's a point where where, where, you re- where it becomes a problem and, and the developers are spending most of their day actually doing that <laughs> instead of actually developing, right? So, so this, 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 um, so yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, it's, it's sort of one of those things, like any kind of scale just uh, exponentially increases those, those problems and make it be felt felt more. So I, I think so. Probably, if you're planning for, um, you know, for some amount of increase and you you know you're getting some funding associated with it, you should probably should. That's a point to actually look and say, and and dedicate some of that funding to to improving your technical platform. I, I would I would imagine. Yeah, it makes sense actually. Um, a, a lot of ways uh, you can you can also look at some of the metrics. Uh, which can yeah. actually help you assess and see what 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 it takes to improve this metrics functional and non-functional way forward. So I think yeah. uh, what you are saying is, and that's how you can actually get much more easy alignment to us allocate some money to that. Yeah, I mean that's the kind of thing about like I feel like it's what you were saying, right? It's like m- maybe in in a you know enterprise session setting, you don't always have to justify everything but i think because resources are so constrained everything just has to be justified and i think the the importance are those metrics and i I think it's good now that um you know people are getting much more familiar with kind of devops metrics and developer experience metrics and you know it's not so unusual for um for for the cto and, and and the whole exec team to sort of understand those and to appreciate them, right? I think in the past, that was maybe more of a problem for developers to advocate for, but um, but yeah. Go ahead, Ajay. I was saying on, on metrics, I have a very interesting thing, ex- experience which I had. One of the things which we did at, at Gojek was we flipped the metrics. We said uh, developer metrics are business metrics and business metrics are developer metrics. So one of the OKRs, or one of when we did an OKR session in in, in, in Kuchet, um, I remember 2018, 2019, one of the company metrics was uptime. Yeah. And and that actually helped us a lot in terms of whenever business people started talking about it and they asked the developers or product managers and they say, will this affect uptime? And 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 we are so happy to see that awareness. If it is gonna affect the uptime, then don't do it right now. Let's prioritize some other time. So people yes. started looking at each product features or so then we started getting the product features or or business requests which are aligned with product engine metrics as well. On the other hand, the completed orders became product engine metrics from the like day one I joined. And the reason was that 
once we can't for suppose one day we did like 1 million orders and next day we did only 900k then developers will get worried saying why it's 900k was it was there a holiday and then we start figuring out things oh there was a holiday or oh, there's a rain happened since rain <laughs> so by the way gojek is a motorcycle delivery a motorcycle ride company that means uh, motorbikes uh, cannot um, fly on on on, on in, in when when there is rain right so if there is rain then we will have less orders and developers started worrying so we started put plotting we started looking at the weather forecast and all stuff saying will it be good day to day for us or not so if you flip the metrics around a lot of times when you make business metrics as part of developers like ecosystem and um product engineering metrics as part of business ecosystem uh, people start caring about it and they start uh, making sure that they do the right thing which is creates a win-win situation on both ends i just yeah. wanted to say that i i think that we are seeing yeah i do see that now more that the technical metrics are part of the business strategy um i think another example is um if if a company is really trying to to hire high high quality engineers then then they then they have to they have to monitor um you know the the developer experience and the engineering satisfaction um and and monitor the amount of friction um in order to actually be able to retain those folks right so i think there are companies that for them as, as their business strategy is having you know these these top quality engineers and and therefore you have to track you know some of those dx metrics associated with it but yeah yeah and you you you've both mentioned morale in various ways in in this and that and i i do think i i do think that that is critical because particularly in the startup and scale up environments where things are changing so rapidly the frustration builds more quickly if you feel like you don't have the right tools to to do your job or there are fixable problems that would would make life better i i i liked what you you said earlier aj about how paying off the technical debt can provide not just okay now we don't have to worry about the debt anymore but that that satisfaction that that gratification um i i've seen that on some of the projects i've i've been involved with where where people they they feel like they have hope again um whereas you know it was you know, there, there was the, <laughs> the pit of despair and then all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, there is light, there is hope. So I, I, I think, I think that that's an, that's an important thing. And, and particularly given how, how hot the talent market is at, at the moment, you know, it, it, it makes business sense to worry about developer effectiveness. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, and, and I'll tell you every high growth or a scaled up environment, uh can be treated as two ways uh one it can be treated as a pit of despair at that march or second it can be treated as a passion and energizing things and trying to get something done every day uh, it also depends on how you portray the problem um a yeah. lot of time um uh, we we actually uh, portray the business problem as constraints rather than excellent engine problems um and and like oh we we are stuck over here and this is what our fate is instead of that we say no this is one of the most complex engineering problem let's solve it um i have seen morale um going down and going up both ways one of the biggest problem happens which i have seen uh, is that not celebrating these small successes if you don't celebrate the small success while you are fighting the war or whatever you want to call it like you want to put as much negative connotation as you can but if you don't celebrate the daily wins uh things go things the morale goes really really bad first thing is that second thing what makes a lot of sense in this this kind of world um uh, uh is that people need to understand um that it's not a it's not a daily grind a uh, lot of time people say okay we come we fight we die we go home and we fix ourselves and again we come we fight we die no it's not like that um it's mostly like we are pushing something daily somewhere so one of the things which made a lot of sense for us to actually paste our dashboards all over the place in organization so we had big monitors and place our dashboards everywhere how many rides we completed how much tons of food we delivered how many so we used to have this metric set how many round trips to moon we did today 
<laughs> because <laughs> because that is that is cumulative kilometers of Gojek drivers. Like we had one million drivers. Even if a driver goes like forty kilometers a day, so we are talking about forty million kilometers a day, correct? Uh, so we can talk about and and this is where a um, lot of engineering leaders need to understand um, that these things go hand in hand. The small wins get a larger far war. You need to understand how to bring the balance between the two. And if you can keep doing that, then everybody will be happy and not that much yeah. of despair will be there. I wanted to, um, I think there's an importance about, it's, it's kind of like transparency of information and strategy, right? It's like, I think sometimes people get frustrated. Like there's nothing worse about, you know, having, having these kind of technical problems and having it not recognized, right? Um, it, and, and it might be that, um, that it's recognized, but it's just not important at, at the moment, right? And so I think sometimes I've seen um, engineers or, or folks just getting frustrated. And a lot of it's because they, they haven't been shared the actual business strategy right now for, from, from, or, or product strategy. And, and it's like, well, we have, we have to optimize this thing. It's like, well, no, but that's not the focus at the moment, right? So, I mean, I've had, um, I've had examples. And I think sometimes when, um, when, the, when that information is shared and, and the, it really, and the engineers internalize it, then they might be okay with, with certain areas um, having technical debt because it's not imp not important right now. Um, like I have a client, we have a client right now where you know we found a lot of scaling problems in in a data in the data pipeline, and the team really wanted to fix them, but you know we're still trying to find product market fit. So it's like, yeah, when we when we have when we have enough customers that the, the data pipeline is a problem, that that'll be a good problem to solve, you know. <laughs> but for the minute, let's focus on the on. Um, uh, the features the customers care about. So, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think that goes back, Ajay, to what you were saying about, you know, flip, flipping the metrics, ma making sure that, that the development teams understand what the business is prioritizing at the moment, and then they can use that to inform the decisions that they're, they're making around, okay, well, if this is what the business priority is, I better go take a look at that because that is going to have to change a lot if this is, you know, what, what our business priority is. So I, I, I think those, those, those two ideas are, are related there. So we, we've talked a little bit about where technical debt comes from, but what about kinds of technical debt? Um, I remember re reading an analyst re report years ago, which said, uh, was talking about the technical debt that is associated with the uh, version upgrades that haven't happened on on your packages, and that's clearly one source of technical debt. And you know, another source of you know technical debt might might be you know something algorithmic, like Ajay, you were talking about with with the driver uh, selection. But but it, it, Tim, what what are some other kinds of technical debt that you've run across? Yeah, because it's interesting, right? When when you think about debt, you you almost kind of think it was like intentional, right? Like we intentionally like missed something and didn't automate something or, or something like that. But um, and it's particularly a problem with startups, right? Because it comes about via um, you know perhaps building a design for something, um, and and then you know the, the 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 strategy changes, and and that design is no longer um, no longer appropriate. So. Um, you know, we often end, we often uh, examine uh, or, or see um, startups where we feel like the architecture has kind of been overfitted to a, a particular problem. It's been optimized for a particular problem, where but the actual um, business and product are still kind of pivoting a little bit. So, and then you end up with that that problem that, that AJ was talking about is with the the sunk cost because you try to change it. To, to fit the new paradigm. So, so sometimes that complexity comes from um, just the pivots. The, the other thing that I've seen is kind of like um, a little bit of, and again, it can be with, it, I think it comes about with scale-ups particularly because um, there's, especially at a certain point, a scale-up will just try to build a lot of features. Um, and we, we often find a lot of um, code, when we examine a code base, we often find a lot of code that just isn't used. And it was because perhaps the the startup um, was maybe very sales driven, so they were building a lot of like features that could be um, you could put on a checklist, 
but but it actually never never used now and and also perhaps a lot of edge cases so and every every developer knows that it's that that edge case that makes <laughs> that, that disqualifies your model and and has to change it and so sometimes you know um what what we see if there isn't enough like dialogue between tech and product sometimes the the tech team will go and create this sort of elaborate architecture to handle an edge case that perhaps you know what it should have just been handled with some you know some some cheap script or something that that rather than accommodated into the core model but that that conversation between products and tech wasn't happening enough um so that so yeah so spending a lot of time i guess on on stuff that wasn't it isn't really that important and doesn't get used that much that's that's one one, one source i see so sort of feature bloat I, i suppose you could call it but yeah um uh, there's one more kind of technical debt which i think a lot of time comes is by by underestimating the accidental complexity so a lot of times when you're being essential versus accidental complexity when you're trying to use some saas trying to get some third party library uh, i'll give a simple example suppose <clears throat> you are trying to go to starbucks or trying to go to some nice coffee point peets coffee or somewhere uh, from your hotel or place every day right Uh, office uh, the ex- essential complexity is that you should know the way uh, that you have to go there the accidental complexity is you have to drive on that road and then you do not have bunch of other people's behavior under control uh, so there is accidental complexity of uh, not able to follow the traffic rules because somebody came and crashed into you or you took a wrong turn because you don't have maps if you have proper map then you can reduce this accidental complexity too much and that's like exposure knowledge lot of time uh, people look at essential complexity and estimate it but they never look at maps or navigator kind of thing which can actually reduce the accidental complexity over period of time and lot of time the technical debt comes because of this accidental complexity uh, i'll give you some examples for example maintaining the cache people know why we are doing the cache but they don't understand sometimes that like few of the cache servers are signal threaded that is accidental complexity they need to deal with when they have a lot of concurrent applications uh when you are looking at you know, like you know, when you are looking at application level sharding or data level sharding accident essential complexity is that you have to create shards accidental complexity is that you need to deal with network layer you need to deal with synchronization you need to deal with cap theorem you need to deal with multiple things and that is accidental complexity and the, what they do they kind of try to do monkey patching for that one side of parameters in cap theorem they'll just try to fix availability and nothing else and then everything else like this goes for toss right and that kind of technical debt is way 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 difficult to solve in the future and people whenever people my i have always tell people that whenever you're looking at some thing as essential complexity have you dig enough to find the accidental complexity associated with it if you don't then please spend five more days 10 more days 20 more days finding that and try to give me the solution for those things instead of just implementing something blindly so that is one of the biggest source of grief i had a lot of times in 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 gojek during my gojek days we could talk about technical debt for, for, forever but uh th- this this has been great fun um thank you tim thank you ajay for your insights into various forms of technical debt and how startups and scaleups can at least be a bit more deliberate about how they take advantage of 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 technical debt so thank you tim thank you ajay join us for the next episode of the thoughtworks technology podcast where we talk to our colleagues georgina and james about the basal cost of software development and maintenance. Uh, Hope to see you then.